Welcome to the annual UTI lecture as we celebrate the 41st anniversary of the Urban Theological Institute at United Lutheran Seminary. Thank you for this rich legacy. United Lutheran Seminary is 195 years old. And for 41 of those years, the Urban Theological Institute, better known as UTI, has been a part of this community. For the last 11 years, we have invited distinguished preachers to come and share with our communities on topics related to the Black church in reference to current events around the world and in our nation. So we thank you for joining us today. And we thank you for your consideration of contributing to the chair in African-American studies named after the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Sr. On the screen, you will see ways of giving. This chair is named in honor of the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Sr. who pastored the Grace Baptist Church of Germantown here in Philadelphia for 42 years. And um, there are two ways that you can give. You can of course give online and when you choose to go online in the area of giving, you will see that name, Jeremiah A. Wright, and if you click on that, you can choose to give your amount. But some of you may want to mail your gift. And let me just thank all of those who have already sent contributions in the mail for the last two to three months. Thank you so much. But if you are sending yours in the mail, when you mail it to the Philadelphia campus, if you would just identify on the envelope, the UTI office, we would greatly appreciate that. So thank you again for your consideration. We are halfway at our mark of $2 million. Let me also say before I introduce our president uh, that our president, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin, will be inaugurated as our president on the weekend of October 15th through 18th. And so we invite you to watch online those celebrations starting on Friday, October the 15th through that is Monday, uh, October 18th. So please join us. Um, after Dr. Irwin will have brought us greetings, we will then have an instrumental selection, Lift Every Voice and Sing by Minister Scott Cumberbatch. After that has been completed, I will return, introduce our lecturer today, and that lecture will be presented in a webinar format. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Guy Irwin, president of United Lutheran Seminary and formerly Bishop of the Los Angeles area for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the annual Urban Theological Institute lecture, celebrating 41 years of the Institute's existence. In those years, the UTI has been a pearl of great price in the life of our Lutheran seminary, which has been enriched immeasurably with the gift of inspired preaching, profound teaching, and deep joy in the love of the Lord. This year, we are also proud to welcome as our lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Jerry M. Carter, Jr., 14th pastor of the Calvary Baptist Church in Morristown, New Jersey adjunct professor of theology at the New Brunswick Theological Seminary, alumnus of Denison, Princeton, and Drew Universities, prominent author and speaker, and good friend of the Urban Theological Institute and of United Lutheran Seminary. He will speak on the church in a post-pandemic era. The pandemic realities have hit all of our churches hard. Some growth in experience and skill have resulted, but also some loss of connection and community. We're still in the midst of it. And in today's conversation with the Reverend Dr. Carter, you'll hear the perspective of a caring pastor and an eager prophet on what we can take as lessons from this experience and how he's coped with it. I ask God's blessing on his speaking and our hearing and pray that together we will all be brought closer to Christ even in this challenging time. Welcome to the Urban Theological Institute's annual lecture.
Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 41st anniversary of the Urban Theological Institute with our annual UTI lecture. As I stated earlier, all donations given online or mail should be earmarked for the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Senior Endowed Chair in African American Studies. And as we approach the $1 million mark, help us so we can surpass $2 million to make sure that this chair is fully endowed. And let me just say thanks to many of you who have already given this year. Uh, many have already sent in the mail starting back in May up until now, and I want to just express my gratitude. Also, I, I want to um, thank all of those who work behind the scene to make this lecture a success our advancement team, our communications department, and our IT department. Now, last year, <laughs> we celebrated the 40th anniversary virtually, and we thought this year we would celebrate in person with a 40 plus one event. <laughs> but the pandem pandemic, it continues. And so today's title is The Church in a Post-Pandemic Era. But the reality is we are still in the midst of that pandemic. And so we chose to err on the side of caution and meet again virtually this year. We hope and pray that you will learn to live and thrive as all of us as we continue to face this and so many challenges. This year, we invited a local pastor who we are familiar with, the Reverend Dr. Jerry M. Carter, Jr., has preached for us on two occasions for preaching with power. And, and I wanted him to come back and lecture because in addition to him being a pastor, he is also an adjunct professor at New Brunswick Seminary and Drew uh, Divinity School. So just allow me now to introduce Dr. Carter to you and we will get started. The Reverend Dr. Jerry M. Carter is the 14th pastor the Calvary Baptist Church of Morristown, New Jersey. He is a faithful theologian whose commitment to articulate the gospel in both written and oratory forms has transformed and shaped the lives of generations. He is a highly sought after revivalist, keynote speaker, lecturer, mentor, and teacher who has been invited to share the gospel in numerous platforms throughout this country. He received his bachelor's degree from Denison University, that's in Granville, Ohio, a Master of Divinity degree, degree from Princeton Theological Seminary, and his Doctorate of Philosophy degree from Drew University in Madison, New Jersey. He is president of the African American Clergy Association of Morris County, that's in New Jersey, and founder and host of How Shall They Hear Preaching Conference. He is an author numerous books and articles. Dr. Carter is a native of Columbus, Ohio, and the proud father of three children. It is my honor indeed to welcome Dr. Carter with us on today. And so as we begin to discuss the church in a post-pandemic era, I sent Dr. Carter just a question or two just to get us started and and in my hopes that uh, we'll be able to move forward with some of those questions. And he will do most of the talking, but let me just start by asking you, Dr. Carter. Tell us about worship at your church, Calvary Baptist Church in particular, but then also the African American church in general before the global pandemic, before March, 2020, describe to us worship at Calvary and how that fit in the general black Baptist Church. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. I appreciate um, this time and I appreciate being able to share and the invitation to be a part of this uh, discussion more so than a lecture. And, and I also appreciate the format here because I think that the back and forth question and answering is uh, really effective in tackling this whole uh, subject matter. So thank you again for, for the invitation and for the opportunity um, to share. Um, worship at Calvary Church here in Morristown, New Jersey was pretty much like 
what was going on across the country. Obviously, uh, worship style and worship attendance and all that differs geographically. It differs sometimes denominationally. Um, it, it, it differs in terms of social class. But I think there are some strands that are consistent across, across the board. And so obviously we were gathering physically. Now, as, as, as obvious as that sounds and as normal as that sounds, looking back on it, we now discover that we couldn't take that for granted, but that's what was happening. We were physically gathering together in sacred space and um, offering ritualistic offerings of, 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 of liturgy and worship together. That's what we were doing. We had meetings during the week where people actually came to the church, Bible studies, um, that people attended physically. I keep emphasizing this intentionally. That's what was happening with us. Now, there was a trend, however, that I recognize also that had become pretty national in its impact. And that was the rise and the evolution of the emergence of virtual worship. That was happening pre-pandemic. Uh, we started live streaming probably, what is this, 2021. Uh, so we probably started live streaming about five years ago, about five or six years ago. And uh, never knowing that we would have to depend on that later, that was just our original intent for live streaming was so that sick and shut-in members could be a part of the real-time worship experience as well as some of our members who are younger members who are going to college, some of the military, some who just live across the country who still wouldn't be a part of the worship experience. And then also as a new means of evangelism, that was another reason that we started the live stream. And so we would stream uh, our 11, 1045 worship service and um, even some of our events at night revivals, so forth and so on, they would be live streamed. Now, again, this is about four or five, five, maybe five years pre-pandemic. So that it was the intent to reach an audience that could not get to the physical building. The assumption was that those who could get to the physical building would continue to come. And that our numbers of in, in attendance would, would be the same, would be consistent, even with the live stream. But here's what started happening here at Calvary and in the African-American church period across the country. And I found this out as a result of some conversation that the in-person worship, in-person uh, attendance started declining to some extent because of the convenience and the attractiveness of the live stream. Um, I think across the board, and this goes even outside the African-American church, that there started to be a decline in physical attendance before the pandemic for a few reasons. One of which I've already mentioned in terms of live stream, but this, this kind of rugged sense of American uh, individualism where, you know, I don't necessarily have to be a part of the communal experience in order to worship God, in order to pray. I can be in my own space and worship God and be off in the woods somewhere near the beach or wherever. And just, it can just be me and God. There's that sense of what, what I've heard called rugged American individualism that started impacting um, communal liturgical experience. And then there was a rise in just casual attitude toward institutional religion, period. 
um, across the board. This sense of casualness um, affected people's attendance and made spirituality more important than religion. And people saw gathering in a building as religion. The spirituality could be nurtured outside of a building. So between that American sense of individualism and that casual attitude toward institutional religion, and you add to that again, the, um, the influence and the impact and the spread of live stream, what started happening pre-pandemic in our church and beyond is you saw this decline and it was a gradual decline. So you look up and you don't see as many people wondering where they are. Um, so that was so that was happening. So the question being what was going on in terms of worship pre-pandemic? We were gathering, yes, physically. We were gathering. I, I can say that a million times. <laughs> physically, we were getting together. At the same time, we started noticing this decline in attendance and a somewhat of a decline in the number of people in our church who were actually joining our church. We had done you know, work to try to find out why um, the demographic change in our community from being African-American to uh, predominantly uh, Latino here in this area of, of Morristown. So that affected us in terms of um, attendance. But the main thing that got us was the virtual influence, this virtual attractiveness of worship and even some of our other activities. So that's, um, for me, that's kind of what I saw happening in worship pre-pandemic. Dr. Carter, before I move to pandemic time, I do want to say, because you also work in the academy, uh, last month uh, we had a faculty meet and we talked about uh, continuing our online classroom presence. Um, but we do plan to meet face to face. Mm -hmm. And in, in that meeting, as we were planning this, um, we were given reasons why students would want to Zoom the class instead of physically attend class. Mm -hmm. And I had to, I remember speaking up and because we gave all the reasons of family and the different things going on in people's life. And I said, also convenience. And That's when you thing. said, yeah, it, <laughs> just convenience sometimes is key. So I want to ask one question about what you just said. I really like the argument you use on religious versus spirituality, um, for, you know, physical attendance versus virtual attendance. Um, would you say during that five-year period prior to the pandemic where your virtual attendance started to increase and your physical attendance started to decrease, did it have any effect on the church's giving level? And I only ask that question from the vantage point of the churches that I work with, uh, where it seems to not be affected by that at all. Yeah. Um, no, I, it wasn't. It wasn't affected because yeah. we provided multiple means by which people could give electronically. Um, you know, the whole uh, Giveify app and PayPal and all that, <clears throat> that has become so common now. And so people from tuning in from California, tuning in from Florida, they began to give toward our ministry because they began to see themselves, which is a weird thing, as members. Um, and so, and I'm probably jumping ahead, So, but, but we had to literally begin to think about redefining what membership was. Oh, yeah. yeah. And people felt like if they were attending every week and they were giving every week, then even if they weren't physically here, then they would be considered members. But our giving did not drop off at all, thank God, 
because even though we didn't see people in the seats, you know, they were still using their fingers to, uh, you know, to click these buttons and, <laughs> they were, <laughs> and they were still giving because they appreciated the ministry and they would hear about some of the things that we were trying to do um, in terms of outreach and service. And so, no, the uh, giving was not impacted. So, Pastor, we will move to the pandemic, but I just want to make you smile. Uh, I, I may be giving my age away when I said this, but I was raised in church where we took it literally bring your gifts to the Lord. So, you know, offering for me, I never remember like mailing the offering or never online prior to this. Uh, I had to go to church and bring the gift because uh, the Bible said bring your gifts. And, uh, and so we go through to- what I like to call paradigm shift. It, it's a paradigm shift. Yeah. It really is a paradigm shift. And, you know, for us, as you, as you may know, in our, in our church, we even believe we took it as literally as bringing it around. You, you, yeah, walk around the table. <laughs> you had to bring your, your offering. Yeah. So you did start moving toward it when you said about redefining church membership. So let's back into that question by just saying, in particular, how did Calvary respond once the pandemic hit back in March 2020? How did you first respond? And, and I'll clue in just for those who are uh, watching us. And, you know, the good thing about this, they are watching us live, but this will be out there for months and some years ahead. So people will hear us later. Um, and I would dare say, um, because you are already live streaming, I would say for you it was easy. There were some churches who were not, and they had to like jump board. But for you, how did you respond yeah. to the pandemic? Yeah. Um, well, it was easier for us. Yeah. It wasn't easy because <laughs> um, we, we had the live stream thing going. And so, but we had to make a lot of improvements technologically as quickly as we can to improve sound and lighting, et cetera. So I will circle back to that. But um, let's say the end of March, third Sunday of March of 2020, we went into this almost this panic mode for a minute because, well, to to some extent it was a panic mode. To, to some extent, it was just like a stop gap measure for us because the assumption for us is that we, this pandemic thing would last for about a month and then we could get back to normal. So we uh, shut down the gathered worship experience to some extent. When I say to some extent is we main, we maintain a live experience on Sundays. We kept that up from the last Sunday of March 2020 till this week, till today. <clears throat> and um, we did that because I wanted to maintain the rhythm of Sunday. Sunday, you know, I know some of my colleagues started pre-recording on Thursdays and Saturdays and this and would re- and rebroadcast on Sundays. And that's cool. You do whatever works for you. But we, we, we maintain the Sunday presence with a skeleton crew of just music people, a couple music people, and a few media people, a couple leaders to help just make it happen. And so live stream, Facebook Live is, that was the primary mode of worshiping. That's how we went out, live on Sunday. <clears throat> and that's what we've done up until this point. Now, obviously, all in-person meetings shut, shut down, in-person Bible studies shut down, and um, everything we did started being virtual. Now, we didn't do anything but worship for about two or three months because, again, we kept saying, okay, we'll, we'll be able to resume normal church life in June 2020. Then June came. We said, mm, okay. Um, we'll be able to resume because we kept hearing that this virus will die down in, in the summer. Um, so we said, oh, we'll be able to resume in September. 
So we're looking forward to it. So there was no need to. So, you know, on one hand, you're trying to exist in the present by adjusting and started having church school, Sunday school uh, via Zoom, started having a couple, a couple even our church meetings via Zoom. But at the same time, you're like not wanting to unpack all of your clothes because you know you're only in this hotel for a few days. That's, that's that was kind of our thinking about this pandemic. Oh, we'll be able to get back in September. Okay, so we don't need to make these permanent adjustments because we will be back. Then September came. And then in the fall, the numbers started spiking and then it got worse. I said, okay, we'll be able to come back in January. Okay, well, the winter, you know, was, was tough. <laughs> and so I know we'll be able to come back in the spring. So all along the, all along the way, there was just this weird kind of um, hybrid thinking of let's just do enough to make it till we get to the end of this pandemic. So there were a lot of adjustments that were made to just try to make it through. Um, but at the same time, we never wanted to settle with where we were um, in terms of virtual ministry because we knew we'd be able to gather in person again. So, you know, that's what our church has been doing um, during this pandemic. There's been the virtual worship, there's been virtual Christian education. And <clears throat> the other piece is because we started noticing in our community that kids weren't able to go to school and get lunches, et cetera, and we did what we could to provide meals on, we had free lunch Fridays, and then beyond that, um, we tried to provide meals beyond Friday, and people were flocking here. Other churches did it in this area, so we weren't the only ones that were doing that, but we try to do it on a day that other churches were, were not doing it. So what I'm saying is our worship, our Christian ed, our service had to take different forms, but we did not want to stop any of it. So, you know, Paul in first or second Corinthians talks about how he became a Jew to the Jews and to those who were under the law, he became like those who were under the law. He had to make adjustments according to his context. And that's what we try to do is to make adjustments according to our context. Now, I will flow over a little bit here. Um, what particularly what I tried to do in terms of teaching and preaching <clears throat> changed because I definitely had to become much more contextual. Um, I couldn't preach and teach without taking into account what was going on around it. So <clears throat> what happened in the spring of 2020, because I, I had this series, I had a sermon series all lined up for 2020. I had it together. You know, I was going to do that thing. <clears throat> but I had to set that aside. Matter of fact, wow. the, 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 the sermon series had to do with Christian service as a part of our five-year plan, whatever. <clears throat> so I had to change. And I be, had to begin to be more topical in my preaching emphasis throughout the year. So I first had to tackle the issue of anxiety. Because when, when, when the pandemic first hit, people didn't know what was happening. It was, we were nervous. Um, some people were um, underestimating this virus. Some people were overdoing it. And so there was this anxiety. So for about a month, I dealt with that whole anxiety piece and really focused on um, Paul's admonition in Philippians chapter four about be anxious for nothing, that whole theme initially. <clears throat> then from anxiety, I had to tackle the subject 
of the Odyssey. And where is God in all of this? So preaching focused quite a bit on Job and the whole issue of where where is God in suffering? <clears throat> because some of our members started losing loved ones. And um, you started hearing all kind of theological slants about how God was using this pandemic to reach people, how God had caused this pandemic. So people were coming to me with questions, Pastor, I mean, really, would God do this and cause me to lose my mother in this? So I had to move from anxiety to theodicy. And then from anxiety to theodicy, had to deal, had to go then toward the whole issue of hope and eschatology. So I had to make these moves in terms of preaching because after the whole theodicy emphasis, people just needed some hope that was grounded in eschatology, you know, to import the future into the present is where I've tried to emphasize. I'm, I'm just trying to show how during the pandemic, the preaching changed from anxiety yeah. to theodicy to uh, eschatology and hope and had to weave in there some emphasis on healing um, and God's, God's interest in the body and the health of the body. Because in the African-American community, as we all know, it's no secret, the pandemic seemed to hit us in a disproportionate way, um, which had to do with some of the pre-existing health issues that we were having and the lack of ex access to health care. <clears throat> so my emphasis was on some of that you couldn't control. Okay, yes, we can fight for access to um, health care, but let's focus on what we can control. And some things that we can control is the care for our bodies in terms of how we're eating and taking our medicine and exercising. Because if your body was compromised, the virus could do you much more harm. So I say that to say there was also an emphasis in kind of the stewardship of the body and healing. So that became um, an emphasis during um, the year. And then we had to move toward endurance because people were just getting tired of it. I was tired of it. And what I found out as a pastor <laughs> is that my own mental and emotional wellness was being compromised because I was just getting tired of it. I was frustrated with not seeing people in the pews. And then um, personally, myself, physically, I had to deal with COVID because I tested positive at some point during the whole thing. And so I was sick, you know, and I, I don't wanna get too personal here, but for a few weeks. So what I started seeing is, and I found out in preaching, or, and this is for any student uh, of theology and seminary, that much of what you're dealing with personally, you can probably preach through the prism of that because most of your members are thinking the same thoughts and having some of the same issues. So your, your own existential kind of foundation and your existential perspective is probably very similar to what to where your members are. So as I was thinking about my own frustration and how I'm getting impatient, I said, well, my members are probably thinking the same thing. So let me do some preaching on endurance. Because in that in that preaching, I was not only preaching to the congregation, but I was first preaching to myself. My preparation time in sermonic planning became the time where God was speaking to me. And as God was speaking to me, um, that got me ready to speak to the people. So taking a long time to answer this question, but this is what was happening in our church during the pandemic. The whole preaching emphasis changed during that time and uh, circling all the way to where we are now. And I've had to be very contextual. You, you know what's interesting 
is when you read the prophets, um, Jeremiah, so forth, so on, um, Ezekiel, even John the Baptist, the New Testament, in Luke chapter three, I was just reading this in my um, daily devotions the other day, in my, my, my devotional reading. John's ministry was introduced by the narrator, the writer here, Luke, talking about what year uh, John came forward. It was during the reign of the emperor Tiberius. Uh, this person was in charge, Anna, Caiaphas. They were the high priests. Then it says, and the word of the Lord came to John the Baptist. Mm. Because the word of the Lord always comes to us in a context. And when you read even the prophets in the Old Testament, it always says, and during the reign of King so-and-so, during the reign of King such-and-such, the word of the Lord came to Amos. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Those are not just facts that are mentioned for trivial pursuit, but that's mentioned in order to set up the context for the word of God. So what I found out during the pandemic, and I may be giving you more than what you asked for, but, but, but what I found out during the pandemic is that the word of the Lord always comes forth in a certain historical climate. And the word of the Lord has to take into account what that climate is. So that's what changed for me during the pandemic um, from a homiletical perspective and a preaching emphasis. I'll stop right there. I, I want to stay in the present before we move to the future, because we are going to go to the future. <laughs> uh, we're going to have you make a prediction here. <laughs> but um, one thing I did want to inquire about, um, you mentioned everything about worship, um, Bible study, how we did prayer meetings and our children, youth. But how did you continue at Calvary in particular to do leadership training? Um, and you can connect that to how shall we hear? Like, mm -hmm. did we have it last year? Are we doing it this year? And, and also pastoral care for your members who are sick and shut in. How did you do that? Um, or continue terms, to do that, I should say. Um, in terms of pastoral care, our, our membership is broken up into, as, some, as is in some other churches, into smaller groups that we call, we used to call sheep folds, we started calling life groups now. And we have diaconate people, both men and women, who are responsible for that segment of their, of the congregation, which is typically determined by geography. So if we have quite a few people who live in Western Morris County, then those people are grouped together and you have diaconate people who, who run those sheep folds. So the way we did pastoral care, was through those sheepfolds, um, through those life groups. And so um, that's how we would find out about sicknesses, um, conflicts, um, deaths, births. And so that information and events would be kind of funneled and channeled into the church office or whatever. And those things were mentioned on Sundays, um, deaths, so forth, and making sure families were affirmed um, from the pulpit. So our primary way of doing pastoral care was to maintain the small groups. So those sheepfolds would have Zoom meetings, Zoom fellowships. It wasn't even a meeting, just a Zoom meeting, just to get on and say hello and to, con and to connect. And the people were so happy to just see each other, even like we're seeing each other now. Yep. And so that became a primary way of doing pastoral care. And that became our primary vehicle for doing leadership development. Um, one of the things, the, one of the opportunities that the pandemic affords is to just start over on some stuff just start over and, um, and to begin to do some replacement and addition of leaders is what, what, what we are attempting to do in our diaconate and our trustee ministry and just leadership across the board. The pandemic gives you an opportunity to start from ground zero because it kind of cleanses 
some um, uh, some things and some moves you wanted to make that could have been a little iffy <laughs> when we were all gathered um, becomes a little easier with the pandemic. So we've used, again, Zoom meetings, um, leadership training via Zoom. Uh, we've done that with our diaconate. We've done that with our ministers, our associate ministers here. So it hasn't been the same, but we have not um, just abandoned leadership development because coming out of this, coming out of this, the church is going to need new new leaders and to some degree, new kind of leaders. And then that's not a slight against those who have been in, but some people who may be open to creativity and technology and even some younger leadership is what we've tried to focus on during this pandemic is developing younger leadership to be coupled with some of the more experienced and seasoned leaders. And <clears throat> with our How Shall They Hear preaching conference, just as an aside, as a footnote, we uh, did it last year as uh, kind of a hybrid. Uh, we had a small live crowd and did it and also had a large virtual crowd, larger virtual crowd. And we plan on doing the same this year. This whole Delta variant thing, you know, is kind of shaking us up a little bit, but we plan on going forward this year with a hybrid approach again. And then just before we go to the future where we will end, um, so it's September now. Um, some churches started going back as early as June, July. Others have waited till this month, September, mm -hmm. to go back. Um, but in every case, going back um, normally requires social distancing, mask wearing in church, um, and in some cases, because your membership is so large, we churches I've known, you have to register. Like you just can't show up. They they need to know you coming so they can plan accordingly. Um, I was just curious. Um, as of September, what has Calvary did? Did you start before September, or yeah. or are you still waiting? Because I said that and forgot to say, and some are still waiting after September. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, some of my colleagues tease me because, you know, they say, man, you were anxious to get back to church. We um, we actually started uh, gathering in person the second, third Sunday of March. Um, we, we started there <laughs> and we, people had to register to come. We had a capacity, even though our state uh, policies, guidelines said that we could have, at that point, maybe even 50% of our capacity could be present. But we, we started off with no more than 50 people. Everybody had to register and masks were required, you know, except for people who went up to the microphone, obviously, to take the mics, to take the mask off and do what they had to do. <clears throat> so what started happening is, People cooperated with that for about three weeks. And then, you know, sometimes in our culture, folks just start doing what they kind of want to do. So um, we increased the number from 50 to like 70, say in May. And we always left space, room for those who did not register. So let's say our capacity was 70. 60 people would register, 10 would not and just show up. And so we factored that crowd in and still was able to maintain social distancing. We went through the whole process of marking off which pews you could sit in, which you couldn't sit in. Um, and, and the thing we didn't think about, which helped us is families didn't need to socially distance. I mean, if you had a family in five, you all could sit right there with each other. And so that allowed for more people um, to actually be able to come to, to, to be safely accommodated. So we, went, we, we try to increase by say 20 people every two months since, since, since March, 50 to 70. <clears throat> then end of June, we went to like 90. 
hundred people. Then we increased, we increased probably more so, maybe like about 130 people. Um, and we've been doing that all along and it's worked well. I mean, just by the grace of God, we haven't had any outbreaks. Uh, most people cooperate. We even started allowing in August <laughs> vaccine. Now here's, it gets a little tricky. Vaccinated for vaccinated people, masks became optional. Yes, for vaccinated people, masks. So the question that, again, my colleagues were asked me, well, what about the people who weren't vaccinated, who weren't honest, you know, who, who wouldn't be honest? How? Because we, 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 we couldn't check vaccination cards at the door. You know, we didn't know how to feel about that. But even with that new policy in our church. The majority of our people still masked up. Um, some of us didn't, who were vaccinated. And we just kind of operated on an honor system. And really haven't had any issues concerning that up to this point. This is coming up to the third Sunday of August. And um, to this point from March, we've been in person, crowd has been increasing, social distancing, momentum is pick them up, is, is picking up. And so far, we may have to change this depending on what our state says, um, but masks are still optional for the vaccinated. So we talked about past and the present with the pandemic. And I think you almost alluded to it sometimes in your answers from past and present about the future. Uh, but let's just go there now. How will this affect the church, both in the near and far future? So notice I'm saying the church, because now I'm not just talking about Calvary now, but all churches. Um, and the reason I meant that you alluded to is when you talked about attendance decline because of the convenience of online. So it was already pointing that that's the future. But can you just expand on that? So sure. what is the future of the church that this <laughs> pandemic has caused? Sure. This this is a great question. I've wrestled with it, you know, prayed about this and um, kind of spoken to, been in conversation with some colleagues. And it's going forward. The hybrid approach of ministry is going to have to be nurtured. There is going to be a need to have the best virtual experience possible. And at the same time, the best in-person experience um, as possible. There are gonna be those who may not return to a physical gathering for some time. And so um, whatever churches can do, and churches have to work with their own financial situation and, and what they can do, um, churches may, some churches may have the resources to pour into the technology. Some may not have as many resources, but whatever resources you have need to be redirected, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> prior, prior to the pandemic, we had, and, I, and I'll use Calvary as an example because other churches are struggling with this. We had talked about a building program. We want to build a new sanctuary, um, accommodate more people, more classroom space. So now, we have to ask our question for the church in the future, do we not build and redirect that into our virtual campus? Um, that's a real question that churches will have to grapple with going forward. <clears throat> so money will need to be poured into technology to make sure lighting is good, um, sound is good, and that you have you know, the best equipment as possible. That needs to be nurtured as well, again, as this physical in-person experience. Now, the other thing I would say is that churches will need, and preaching and teaching going forward, will need to emphasize the importance of being gathered together physically. Um, I'm, I'm not buying the whole idea that we just need to concede and kind of give up on physical in-person gathering. <clears throat> um, 
two things stick out to me. One is worship. Virtual, virtual worship is a great supplement, but it's not meant to be a substitute for in-person gathering. There, in, um, I've been, been looking at, again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, and there is a need, even in worship, for people to be physically gathered together. The whole nature of worship involves sacrifice. So the conversation about virtual worship being convenient, yes, it is convenient, but that to some degree takes away from the whole nature of worship experience. To worship means to sacrifice. It may mean to put some clothes on and get yourself together and burn some gas and go to a physical place because worship starts with that act of sacrifice. So to be able to roll over and press a couple buttons and watch worship as I'm eating my pancakes or making my breakfast, you know, or as I'm exercising, um, thank God that we've had that medium, but I do not think we can lean on that as a crutch, that in the church of the future is going to have to emphasize in its preaching and teaching the need for being in person and in worship because we have to rebel against the temptation to just give in to this individualistic mindset. Communal worship is necessary. So that's one thing. <clears throat> the other piece going forward with the uh, Church of the Future is that we will need to emphasize the importance of in-person discipling and discipleship, because it's my belief that when Jesus called disciples to be discipled, he didn't just call them to him. He also called them to each other because a big part of being discipled and growing in our faith is human interaction. Um, it's difficult to grow in discipleship and in faith via Zoom just total, totally via Zoom meetings and classes. And because being, discipleship is more uh, than just about the dissemination of content. It's about the interaction with people sometimes who get on your nerves and people who you have to adjust to and compromise with. That happens in the in-person gathering. So if you ask me about the future, the future of the church will need to emphasize those two, those two things the need for gathering in in-person worship and the need for in-person disciple. Um, where is it? Hebrews, where the yeah, writer yeah. says, uh -huh. let's not forsake uh, the gathering of the people, the assembly of ourselves together. We often quote that part, but what we leave off is the reason for that. The writer goes on to say, and let us provoke one another unto good works and unto growth. That whole idea of provoking one another happens when we are together. It, it kind of it, it, it kind of literally means irritating each other into better, provoking one another into better. And it's difficult to do that virtually. That there is a need for in person gathering. So you asked me about the future, and I will reiterate, it's going to require the best we can offer um, virtually and the best we can offer physically, those two being integrated, <clears throat> because we have discovered that the Great Commission can now be obeyed through technology. Go into all the world? Yes, you can do that through Facebook Live. <clears throat> at, at the same time, we got to emphasize people getting back together. Yes, we often used to say, you don't have to be in these four walls to worship God. You don't have to be in these four walls to serve God. That may be true, but being within these four walls, being in this sacred space is going to be critical to the development in discipleship and in the development of the worship experience. So going forward, that's what I see um, the church has to rebel against the temptation 
to concede to convenience. Church has to rebel against that temptation. Dr. Carter, I want to, um, you know, let you have some closing remarks if you like. And, and what you prompted, and I'm so glad you did this, uh, is that forsaken of the assembly. So um, Dr. J. Wendell Mapson preached recently about um, returning to church and how happy people were to see one another. But we could see each other at Walmart. <laughs> we could see each other at Target. We, so it, it's not just in person. It's something about in person and with God at the same time. And, and, and you hit it with that, that gathering for worship, provoking one another. But there is something about the sacred space. Yes, um, it is. Not to forsake that assembly. So um, as you give just your closing remarks, if you can just touch on that, because there are those who would say, but I can worship God at home alone. So what, what is so unique about worshiping God <laughs> in the sanctuary with others that's different than when we're at home worshiping? Sure. Um, during the pandemic, you know, I, I, I try to exercise a little bit, stay in some semblance of shape. And during the pandemic, my gym closed down, of course, and I had to exercise at home by myself with the little bit of equipment that I had. It was just me. I would turn on some music sometimes, do push-ups and all that. Um, that was one kind of experience. My gym reopened, oh, maybe January with a mask and all that. Being back in that environment, watching other people exercise, seeing different kinds of equipment, and just the gathering of people who had the same purpose took my workout to another level because it was one thing to work out by myself. It's another thing to work out in that particular context with other people who came for the same purpose. It challenged me because I got kind of apathetic and uh, got used to my routine when I was by myself. But when I'm with other people, I see uh, new things I can do, et cetera. Okay, there it is for me. Worshiping alone is one thing. Worshiping together because, um, listen, it is true, we often, it's almost become a cliche, that where two or three are gathered together, the Lord promises to be in the midst. And so with our coming together, there is a different kind of experience of the spirit of God, because we are part of the body of Christ. And when we come together, that body comes together, worship, service, singing, praying, preaching, everything goes to another level. I found out preaching, I, I had to preach to a camera sometimes. Sometimes it would just be me and a camera. What was missing was the congregation. I had a Bible, I had a sermon, I had a microphone to speak into, camera, but what was missing was the people. And our coming together brings with it a different kind of experience of the manifested presence of God. God is everywhere. God, God can be in your home. God can be in your, in your car. But the manifested presence of God seems to be stronger when the people of God come together. And that's why we leave with courage that we didn't have before we came. That's why we leave with direction we didn't have before we came. That's why we leave with resolve that we didn't have before we came. That's why we leave with a sense of forgiveness that we didn't have before we came because the manifested presence of God reveals itself more completely when the people of God are gathered together. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. Um, I recall, I think we met 2010 when you did the citywide revival for Philadelphia Baptist Ministers Conference. Yes, and uh, I said, I got to get you to come preach and teach or, sure. or preach and lecture. And um, then I ended up only inviting you to preach. <laughs> right. so, this, so this today is really an honor to have you because we've heard you preach twice for us doing Preaching with Power. Thank God we got to hear you also. Yes, sir. 
just teach, lecture, and share with us. This was very rich. And the seminary community thanks you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity again. Thank you, sir. Would you join me again in thanking the Reverend Dr. Jerry M. Carter, Jr.? This was a rich discussion. Uh, yes, it was the lecture, uh, but we decided to put it in a format where it looked like a conversation. And this was so rich and, and it is something uh, that we can look back on in the days, months, and even years ahead. Thank you again for your attendance and your support. Um, as I close out, again, I'd just like to invite you to consider donation to the Jeremiah Wright Chair on the screen is ways to give. And I do want to thank our seminary community, our students, our faculty, our staff, all who make this happen. Again, thank you, Dr. Carter. Blessings to you and your ministry. We look to see you all again in the future. God bless you.